The world that we live in is filled with chaos. We are all searching for meaning in our lives, but we often get lost along the way. We all must ultimately realize that meaning is found in responsibility for our actions, for the way we live our life, and for the people in our lives. We don't have to stay in the chaos. We can choose to bring order to our lives. Join us for a fresh perspective on the practical steps we can take to become who God intended us to be and to realize what our calling is. This is Coming Out of Chaos. Welcome back to the Coming Out of Chaos podcast. My name is Michael Bachlig. I am your host, and I am joined by my friend and co-host, Bryce Kirk. How are you doing, Bryce? I'm doing well, Michael. Thank God. All right. Well, we have once again moved our makeshift podcast studio out of the upper room and back to an undisclosed location for this recording. We do try to record this podcast at our local church at St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Springdale whenever we can, but sometimes we just have to call an audible depending on our schedules and just everything we have going on. And we've had a lot going on at our local parish, Bryce, over these last few weeks. And it's honestly been a bit hard to find the time to do these recordings, just with the many things that we have going on, the things we're committed to. Uh, But I'm grateful we're still finding a way to get these podcast recordings done, you know, about every other week or so. Uh, We recently had a transition in our church where our former pastor, Father John Atchison, retired. And our new pastor, Father Paul Fuller, was just assigned a few months ago. And and Bryce, Father Paul has really hit the ground running, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree. It's been a whirlwind over the last couple months, but in a very good way. Um, You've seen people kind of coming out of the woodworks who weren't super involved in things before, and the people who were involved in things just kind of kept the ship going. And we all work in tandem really well with our new priests. So thank God it's been it's been wonderful. Yeah, there's been a lot of highlights and things that Father Paul's even been able to start in the early going. You know, he's had a a catechism class that actually just wrapped up. He was doing a class each week for kind of a four-week series on an education in the faith. And we just started doing the Paraclesis service for the Nativity. The Nativity Fast just started this week, and so you know, we showed up for church, and there were there were 50 people at church for a paraclysis, Bryce, and I don't think I've ever seen that before, and it was a real blessing to see that many people at a service in the middle of the week like that. Yeah, Michael, I think it's been great just to see so many people wanting to be at church. There's always something going on, and people are there to learn. I mean, with the catechism class, for instance, like, I've been Orthodox for four years, and you've been Orthodox your whole life. And I think we both come out of that learning a lot from Father Paul about the breadth and the depth of the church and being able to hear everybody's questions yeah, and being able to participate in the life of the church. Because we most recently, I mean, we did our services for Great Lent, which seems like it was just yesterday, but I guess it's been over half a year. Yeah, it's been a while now. And just being able to see that with the Nativity Fast, it kind of brings me back to those days, just kind of being in in the church with everybody and being able to experience everything and being able to hear such beautiful hymns and understanding what they're saying. Yeah, it's, they really are. They're uh, beautiful. Yeah, an absolute blessing. So I'm definitely looking forward to more of what we have to do and and more of just being Orthodox. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a lifetime thing. It is. And then the Nativity Fast having just started really you know, it, it, it just signals a shift in that liturgical year that we've talked about in previous episodes, uh, and it, it tells us that something big and important is happening. You know, it's called in our church the Winter Pascha uh, for a good reason. There's a preparation period, and we find ourselves in that now, and, you know, as we head towards the incarnation of our Savior, uh, what better way than to be together as a church community in services like the Paraclesis? It's been it's been quite a blessing, and uh, and although our schedules are are very full, it's been it's been very spiritually fulfilling and rewarding. Which uh, for some of our non Orthodox listeners or inquirers, definitely like go to a local parish and try to get in on some of these services just to experience them because you get to experience things kind of from our point of view, right? And getting to understand the deeper aspects of the nativity and of life, the church as a whole. Yeah, and if you're there and they have the the actual the book of the service, try to try to find one and follow along. The words are so deep and there's so much meaning in it. 
Uh, you know, you, you mentioned Bryce, the catechism classes that, and how, how wonderful those have been. The catechism never ends. You know, when you become an Orthodox Christian, when you're chrismated, you know, we still are learning. I'm learning every single day. And, you know, there is a catechism period before someone is accepted into the church, into the Orthodox church. But uh, really that, that learning process just continues. And as we kind of progress through life, there's deeper meanings and, and, and things that are revealed to us. And it just becomes a more rich experience as we kind of go through the year. Uh, and we kind of experience that over again, like we've been talking about. So Bryce, last time we started to talk about the crisis that men are facing in our culture today, and some of the specific ways that manhood is really under attack these days. A lot of the content in that episode came from that first ever Antiochian men meeting that occurred at the Parish Life Conference for our diocese about two and a half years ago. There was much that was talked about in that meeting, and it was truly a life-changing experience for myself. And I know you've said that it was for you too, Bryce. And in this episode, we're going to start off by talking about some of the roots of this crisis, and then what our response should be as Orthodox Christian men. So let's start out by talking about what we're up against, and why this crisis that men are facing even exists in the first place. So when the United States of America was founded, it put forth the Declaration of Independence. And in that document, we're told that we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are considered to be unalienable rights, which means rights that are claimed to be inherent to all humans and can't be taken away. It also claims that these rights were given to all humans by their creator, And personally, I feel that this pursuit of happiness part of that phrase is the root cause of a lot of the problems we're seeing here in the United States today. We're living in a very individualistic society. We're taught and we're encouraged to pursue individual instant self-gratification all the time. I mean, that's what our culture teaches. If you have a little bit of pain or discomfort in your life, there's just plenty of distractions available to us that promise to help alleviate the suffering or to fill that void. And it's also all right now, anytime I want it. And I can do it in the privacy of my bedroom, or for men, maybe they have a man cave where nobody else can see us or interfere with us. It's, it's just a very me-centered mentality and a me-centered culture that we live in. And it's been accelerated exponentially by technology. And this is a problem that is truly unprecedented in the history of the church. Yeah, that's definitely true. And you know what it makes me think of, Michael, is there was an experiment done several years ago with some young kids, and they were given a marshmallow. And they said, okay, you can eat this marshmallow now, or you can wait 10 minutes, or however long the time period was, and we'll give you two. And I don't remember the exact results of this study, but many people, either they went ahead and ate it, or they waited, delayed gratification yeah, to get more of it. And I do think that this speaks to a common theme in perhaps American culture, but maybe Western culture as a whole, to everything is available to you right away. Anything you could ever want, anything you could ever dream of, for the most part, is a Google search away, entertainment especially. And so, you know, it also makes me think of a few years ago, Bishop Nicholas came to our parish, and he was talking about how, you know, parents are texting their kids, and their kids are texting their parents, and they'll be in a different room of the house. Yeah. And what it does is it really just disconnects the human person from one another. And so I think by even a simple task of getting up and going and walking into the next room and talking <laughs> to somebody, right? it seems like it's a very difficult thing for people to accomplish. And I do think that people have a difficult time thinking outside of that immediate, I want this, I need it now, that sort of thing. Yeah, I remember that in person when Bishop Nicholas visited us, and we had actually a meeting with all the men in our church. And I actually remember there was a point in the meeting where he pulled out his smartphone. You know, he pulled out his phone and showed it to us, and he he asked us, what is this called? And, you know, we were saying a smartphone. He's like, it's called the iPhone. And for those of us that have Apple phones, I mean, we all know what the iPhone is. And he talked about how the very name of the iPhone was essentially a marketing trick. It was a well-thought-out trick to try to get people thinking along the lines of only needing themselves. And this phone 
is really all that you need really to be happy. You have everything just at your fingertips that you can ever think of that you could need. And so that iPhone name just speaks to this kind of individualistic mentality that we have in our country. And I think a lot of people try to exploit this individualistic mindset to make money. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And again, I mean, it kind of just goes to show what the priorities of the culture at large are, and that is to make the individual even more individual and not, I don't want to say some some type of nefarious thing where people are being purposely pulled apart, but at the same time, you look around you, and that's kind of the point that it's come to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I can definitely feel that. I think those listening to this probably know exactly what we're talking about. And really underlying all of this is the fact that technology in the last few decades has really just been a game changer. It really hits home with me too, Bryce, because I'm 40 years old, which means that I was growing up in the 80s in a time when you know, a lot of this technology was starting to become available to the average family for the first time. You know, things like personal computers, uh, video games. We've talked a lot about video games. You know, I remember starting out with an old Atari system, if you even know what that is, Bryce. <laughs> uh, later, Nintendo, you know, the NES system rose to popularity. Oh, yeah. You know, then it was Sega Genesis. I remember getting my first Sega Genesis. And if you just think about video games, just think about how much those have changed over the years and how advanced video game systems are now. Yeah, they definitely be, have become a bit more all-encompassing. Um, I, it makes me think of games uh, where you basically design your character and you go off and do these quests, you know. And it, I mean, these things seem rather straightforward, but they do end up taking up a lot of your time. Yeah. I have friends who've logged several hundred hours playing video games. Um, I believe when we were at the fall retreat, there was a kid who talked about how many hours he had logged in a video game, which isn't to say that things like video games are inherently bad. But again, when it becomes an aspect of who you are to the extent in which you spend most of your time doing it, right? then it becomes an issue. And you do see yourself, I mean, Father Hans has talked about this, you see yourself as the hero, you see yourself mm -hmm. as the champion, not in the real world, but in a virtual reality. And so, I mean, with VR and even this new Facebook metaverse, yeah, like there's been talks of, you know, kind of establishing an online network more akin to real life, but it'll never be the same thing. Yeah, it's like there's there's always this effort to try to create a fake or a virtual reality <clears throat> so people have something to escape into that's not actual reality. You know, and, there, and the other thing, Bryce, that I was thinking about is just how insidious it has become by these video game designers, there's communal aspects that are being designed into the game now. So it really kind of appeals to our human, you know, yearning to be in community and it sucks us and keeps us in these, you know, ecosystems of these games where there's, you know, you have a headset on and you're talking to people from all over the country or all over the world. Even in some smartphone games, there's chat rooms that are integrated into the game. And so you have this kind of virtual fellowship environment that's keeping you just sucked into this virtual atmosphere. And you're establishing friendships with people who you've never actually met face to face. And in some cases, this takes the place of in-person relationships and interaction. I suppose, too, that people have become a bit more dependent upon that with the recent pandemic. Um, I mean, our state's pretty open, but other states have not had the same luxury. And even if they have, people tend to just want to close into themselves and stay in that environment as long as they need to or as long as they think they need to. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think the pandemic has kind of made a lot of these things just kind of more heightened and kind of more important for us to realize what's really going on and, and to not get kind of swept away by the current of everything. So technology makes things like video games, like we've been talking about, and, and other things like pornography. We talked a lot about that in our last episode and, and really all kinds of entertainment. You can really watch all kinds of entertainment on your phone and, and stream it live in some cases. It's all available instantly, and it's literally right at our fingertips on our smartphones, tablets, and computers that we just tote around with us wherever we go. So we have access to so many things now, and the temptations are with us constantly. And it's more intense now because of how easy it is for us to engage with distractions, to keep us entertained and feeling happy. 
When we take things too far, we may know we are sinning, and we may try to not think about the fact that God knows, but we can't keep secrets from God, and we also can't play dumb with God. God is all-knowing, and if we know better, God knows that we know better. We may lie to ourselves and think that since none of the people at our church knows that we're sinning, or your wife doesn't know, or your kids don't know that you're sinning, it can just be your secret. And there's even a thrill factor where the danger makes it all the more tempting to some people. And this is essentially how the devil attacks. And I've learned this the hard way. You know, the devil really tries to divide us. He convinces us that we're individuals. He also seeks to trick us into thinking that our sins really don't affect other people. They just affect us. Then we rationalize and try to convince ourselves that sin really isn't that bad because we can do whatever we want to if it makes us feel happy. After all, we live in a culture that preaches to us that we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, and I do want to touch on the point that you made, Michael, about how, you know, things that you do, you believe to be in secret. Um, I mean, for example, take uh, when Cain killed his brother Abel Mm -hmm. in the book of Genesis. He attempted to hide that in a way by saying, am I my brother's keeper when he was confronted with the disappearance of his brother. I mean, these things affect other people, and in Cain's case, it affected him for his entire life on earth. And so, you know, you may think that something that you do is just for you, it just affects you, but unfortunately, it bleeds out in other ways, and not just in some type of karma way. It is in the way of, it affects how you act. It affects how you treat yourself. It affects how you treat other people. And, I mean, that's, that's a problem, obviously. It's some, and it's, it's not something that we should be shaming others about, but it's something to keep in mind as you go through your life and try to become more holy. Right. Now, it's important to keep in mind for sure. And, and also, the trick that the devil uses with all of this wonderful technology that we have, he uses these tools to trick us into thinking that all we need is ourselves to be happy, and that's a lie. We really need each other, and we need to be in community. The lie that we are individuals and not persons meant to be in communion with each other has really created this crisis and this epidemic that's happening. And I'm not talking about the COVID epidemic. I'm talking about the epidemic of individuality. And many men are too embarrassed and ashamed to even talk about it in many cases. A lot of men are seeking help, but they don't know where to go. And that's our job. Our job as men in the church is to come alongside these other men and to show them the way. As we've said before, and as Father Hans has said, our spiritual advisor to the Antiochian men, he said that men need men in order to learn how to become a man. You don't learn it from women. You don't learn it from the dominant culture. It's brotherhood. You can't do it alone. Men in the church are brothers with each other. Christ himself, in fact, said, greater love has no one than this that lay down one's life for his friends. And that comes from John chapter 15, verse 13. Yeah, Michael, I do want to touch on one of the points you made, too, about, you know, learning manhood, right? So in American culture, we tend to have this uh, romanticized view of the rugged individual. In some cases, I think it's good to look up to your heroes, but at the same time, you cannot do anything by yourself. You can't learn how to be a man from yourself. And, you know, this verse especially resonates with me because it does exemplify the community that Christianity has. And, I mean, Christ himself went to the cross for us. No greater love than that. No greater love than the martyrs. No greater love than men in war giving their lives for each other, trying to survive. You know, things of that nature. It just it speaks so much to the human condition more so than, oh, I'm an individual. I'm going to go do this by myself because I'm destined for greatness. And perhaps, but at what cost? Exactly. And you know, that shift in mentality is so important because when men pull themselves together spiritually and they're in union with God, their wives will become more stable and their children will become more joyful. It's something that just naturally happens as a result of that that shift. This doesn't happen overnight. It's definitely a process. It isn't an overnight fix. It isn't like you can reach a certain level and all of a sudden, you know, the devil just will start ignoring you or that, you know, the devil will stop attacking you at some point. In fact, the closer you get to God, 
you'll find the more the devil attacks. And this is something I feel is very important to always keep in mind. It should always keep us vigilant. You know, the devil doesn't bother attacking the people that he kind of already has in his claws and has enslaved. He's going to attack the people who seek to become more like Christ and those who start to repent, those who do good works. And why is that? I think it's because those people are more of a threat to him. It undermines his strategy and has the potential to lead more people to Christ. Yeah, and I think, you know, he already knows that he's lost, right? He already knows that Christ has defeated death through his own death. Exactly. He's harrowed the gates of hell. You know, he's done all of these things for us. But at the same time, it doesn't stop him from trying to wreak some type of total war, you know, trying to do a scorched earth on humanity, essentially, trying to take as many people with him. Yeah. And it is important to be vigilant. I mean, that is one of the tenets of the Antiochian men organization that Michael and I are in, being vigilant, and you know, and not just being vigilant for yourself, but being vigilant for your brother as well. And, you know, it makes me think of a couple of instances in my life where, you know, I've had explicit run-ins, you know, after talking to clergy and kind of getting an idea of what happened to me, but explicit run-ins with demonic elements in the sense of they tried to scare me. They tried to throw me off my path Mm -hmm. and, you know, all men fall. But at the same time, it, it doesn't seem to me to be an excuse to give up and to not repent again. Right. And, and I do think that these things are important to keep in mind because it, I do think it does embolden you at times when you are afflicted with these, of course, not under the inclination of prelest through the guidance of your spiritual father, but at the same time, it's there to deepen you. Yeah, Bryce, and you used a, an important word there, prelest, and our listeners may not know what that word means. Why don't you kind of give a definition for us? Yeah, uh, prelest basically means that you have a false sense of spirituality, so essentially meaning that you are purified, that you kind of understand everything as it is given to you. You're thinking of yourself more than you really are. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a false sense of of self right. to some degree. And so it does remind me of this quote from St. Siloam the Athenite, where he says, understand two thoughts and fear them. One says you are a saint, the other you won't be saved. Both of these thoughts are from the enemy and there is no truth in them. But think this way, I am a great sinner, but the Lord is merciful. He loves his people very much and he will forgive my sins. Mm, That's a great quote. And that speaks really well to what we've been talking about. You know, Bryce, I personally feel that the days of lukewarm Christianity are over. The days of shallow cultural Christianity, I think they're really over. I personally love culture. I love that we come from a long history. You know, the Syrian, the Russian, the Greek, and the Orthodox Church, there's all different backgrounds and cultures. And I love that. I really do. And it's perfectly appropriate here in America because we're in a melting pot. So I'm not against culture. I'm actually very pro-culture in the healthy sense. I like going back to the fathers and the grandfathers, the lineage, because that's what we're talking about here. It's important to know where we came from. But having said that, the dominant culture is such that there is a hostility to Christianity that's just bubbling up. And the only way that I feel you're going to remain a Christian is if you're serious about your faith, and we have to be aware of this. But in that seriousness, we discover things. And we bring a real power and clarity and a healing forward because it's all about Christ. He's the Redeemer, and it's our job to bring that forward in the culture where many people are looking for meaning, looking to become something more than they are, as you've said, Bryce. If you're listening to this right now, and if you're part of an Orthodox church that's open to this, and it will be if you are, the Lord himself will bring people to you and to your church. We see this right now in our local parish. Men are coming off the streets. God is really leading them there. In some cases, young couples. Men may come and they may bring their spouse with them. This is not a supposition. I'm telling you, if you open up your parishes to life, you will pull in the young because the young are looking for life because they're trapped. We've had quite a few people in our own parish with kind of this experience themselves, Michael, including myself. I think, you know, people just kind of stumbling on in. Maybe they've read about it. Maybe they've heard about it. Right. Maybe they did a quick Google search of churches near me. But either way, people are pouring into churches. I think it's more or less a trickle in some cases. Perhaps for others, it's a stream. For our own parish, I think it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. 
And I think people are searching for something more. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for authenticity, not just in the worship, but from the people. Right. And I think that parishes that are well-equipped, which, I mean, if you're listening to this and you're in a parish, I think that you have a desire to be well-equipped. You have a desire for other people. And I think that if you're listening to this, you are well-equipped. You have a desire to help other people. And I think that, you know, when you have the right environment and you have the right culture in a church, that people are going to be drawn to that. And Christ will lead those people to your community because he knows that they need to be taken care of. Yeah, and I also think it's important we recognize that we all have a role in creating that culture that you're talking about, Bryce. We can't just sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. Each of us have a role to actually contribute to making a positive culture in the churches that we're a part of. So I really want to get practical now. There's probably a lot of men listening to this that feel lonely, isolated, cut off from others. You know, I've felt that way many times in my life, especially when I was younger. And it's a very discouraging feeling. Everything we've been talking about might sound great, but it may be hard to know where to start and what the battle plan really should be. There are probably a lot of fathers out there who are trying to raise their kids the right way, all while suffering through this crisis that we've been talking about and wanting to know the best way forward. You know, Bryce, I've mentioned our Antiochian Men YouTube channel that we have, and I did an interview recently with a priest from the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese named Father Michael Marcantoni. He was one of the speakers at the spiritual retreat in our diocese that we attended last month. Father Michael gave some great guidance and advice in that interview. It's another one of those videos I would really highly recommend that everybody watch. But at the end of that interview, I wanted to kind of bring something up that he had said, and I'm going to quote him here. Father Michael said, There's two ways to fulfill the covenant with Yahweh, the God of Abraham. One is flawless execution. And I think for most of us, that ship sailed a long time ago. And he even said, ask my wife. And I can honestly say, you know, ask my wife. I can relate to that. But, you know, he said there's a second way and a better way, and that is genuine repentance. Again, quoting him, he says, genuine repentance is also counted as righteous faithfulness, so much so that Christ says that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. And that's from Luke chapter 15, verse 7. That means it's easier for 99 righteous men to flawlessly execute than one brave, intrepid soul to repent. So guess what? We're called to repentance. It is the beginning of Christ's preaching, and it counts as righteous faithfulness. If we can't give our kids the flawless image for the rest of their life, we can at least give them a faithful image of a comeback story. We can show them that dad is still learning, that I'm going to make amends, I'm going to be accountable, and say, hey son, I realize here are the areas that I've fallen short, now watch me make amends. I think the comeback story uh, anecdote really speaks to me personally, Michael, because, you know, growing up in this culture, and I mean, in America, at its core, you know, some of the first Europeans to arrive here were Puritans. Mm -hmm. And Puritan culture doesn't necessarily account for a prodigal son type of person or a comeback story type of person. That's true. And, you know, people need to be given second chances and as in orthodoxy, you know, second and third and fourth and fifth and down the line and being able to present a man who says, yes, I messed up, but I'm going to make it better. Yes, I fell, but I'm going to get back up. And setting that example for somebody when they get despondent or when they get complacent about things, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've fallen on my face and did not want to get back up. But I look at people like my own father. I look at other people that I've encountered in orthodoxy. Michael, I look at you. You know, people who they fell on their face from whatever it was, but they got back up and they showed that example that they weren't going to give up, that they weren't going to surrender to anything, and that victory would be possible and it would be a long, arduous road, but, but they were willing to take on that burden and not do so alone. Yeah, and you know, talking about repentance, repentance is it's a process that's often misunderstood, especially with young adults. And having been one, I can actually relate to this a lot. The sacrament of confession is often misunderstood in the Orthodox Church, even by some who've been in the Church for their entire lives. You know, I, especially being the son of a priest, had approached confession the wrong way for most of my life because 
honestly, I didn't want rumors spreading that the son of a priest was doing this or that. And, you know, I had a lot of fear. I was embarrassed because I knew so many priests personally. I still do. And a lot of those priests knew who my dad was and were friends with him. So I had a lot more fear about confessing my sins than maybe some other people out there. And that caused me to hold back in confession. But you know, the secret to eliminating habitual sin is not just having someone make an empty promise. That's not going to break the cycle. And why is that? Well, what happens when we flush out the evil from our system and we don't replace it with something holy? That's the secret. You don't repent from something unless you're truly prepared to repent from it. And what does it mean to be ready to repent from something? It means being ready to replace that evil thing with something holy. Because if you don't, the demon that was taking up residence within you will bring seven of his friends back to a tidy, clean temple of the Holy Spirit, and it will be worse than it was before. And where does this concept come from? Bryce, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. Why don't you read that part of Scripture? When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Bryce, I got to say, that was me. And for much of my life, I was repenting from the same sin on a weekly, daily, sometimes an hourly basis. And it really shouldn't be like that. If you're repenting and then you're just falling right back into that same thing again right away, there's definitely a problem. But we don't know how to tell, especially young adults, how to replace the sin with virtue. I feel like we can do a better job, and I'm speaking just from my perspective as laity. When we talk to the young men that are out there in crisis, trapped in a cycle of habitual sin, you know, they feel really bad about this stuff. They know that their energy is dissipated, but they don't know how to pull themselves out of that vortex. They may be intimidated to walk into a church. They may be intimidated to approach a priest and talk about it, and sometimes we can be that first step. That vortex in that battle of trying to pull themselves out and kind of falling back in, that's where the devil works. We talked about pornography in the last episode, and we mentioned that Father Hans has said that porn comes from the depths of hell, and it really does. He also went on to say that it comes to destroy the characters of young men before they have a chance to discover who they really are and what they can do. We have the tools of healing in the Orthodox Church. When a guy takes that step to live a right life, which is to say to become a full and authentic man, and I'm going to go back to that quote that we talked about in our last episode, the glory of God is a man fully alive. That's something that St. Irenaeus said. Just think about that. The glory of God is a man fully alive. And men want this. They want to be strong. You take their God-given creative energy, and here's where they need a spiritual father and a mentor or a guide You take that energy and you begin to direct it, and you encourage him to apply his natural gifts and to apply what his abilities are. The problem is a lot of men don't know what their gifts and abilities really are because a lot of them just haven't yet had a chance to go out and test things, which kind of reveals what those are to them. That's where the father or the mentor or the guide comes in. And mentoring or guiding somebody is really just a kind of fatherhood. When a more experienced man comes alongside one who is less experienced, the father comes in and says, you know what, you are really good at this and you should try this. And what happens is he kind of tentatively tries and goes, I can do this. I like this. And that is where the brotherhood part comes in. And that part is so important. I do think that this speaks to not doing things on your own because I think everybody has talents, right? Whether they know it or not. And it's not just burying them. It's not just kind of neglecting them or selling them off. It's what are they and where can I build them back up? And, you know, in my own conversations with my spiritual father, I've been able to kind of understand, okay, this is what he sees in me. And he has the discernment, I think, to see what other people see in me and not necessarily that I should care what others think to such a degree that it consumes me. But at the same time, I think other people can be a great guide to you, especially your spiritual father, and helping you understand what you are good at and where you need to build upon, you know, where your passion is. 
And when you do that, it speaks so much more to how you can help yourself and how you can help the church and how you can help your brother and other people as well. Yeah, Bryce, and what you're describing is really the the healing process. That's where the healing happens. Because as a young man really steps up to the plate and he starts moving, and there's no creativity without moving. You know, there's no creativity without risk. Risk kind of entails fear, and they may feel fearful because they may have failed a lot in the past. So all that stuff is going to be there, and it's going to be bunched up into kind of this big gray cloud. But just like the Spirit hovered over the face of the water, the waters of chaos, and the Logos, Christ himself, spoke and brought order out of the chaos in his creation, that's what the mentor does. He speaks the truth. And instead of being lost in that cloud, he hears the word and he takes the step. And because there's movement, there can be progress. And this is synergy. This is where we work together with God. You know, it's not that God is doing all the work for us, and we're not doing all the work ourselves. That's the synergy. We work with God. When a man experiences this, a person is born again. He is reborn, because his renewal and his redemption takes place in the concrete expression of his own created manhood. We have all the tools we need to put this into practice in the church, and it takes effort. It takes commitment, and it also takes consistency. If we try to do this on our own, like you said, Bryce, it's really an arduous uphill climb. But when we do this in community with each other, in brotherhoods, and in our church communities, it just becomes so much easier. It's easier because we can shoulder each other's burdens, we can support each other, and ultimately help each other to become more like God. Yeah, we've been telling you guys, you know, and you don't necessarily need to hear it from us, but it's a simple but not an easy path to go forward. And it reminds me of something Father John Atchison told me a couple years ago, is anything you do, do it with all your might. And so, again, you may have, I don't want to say delusions of grandeur, but you may have big plans in mind, and those are great. But the way you get to those things is through those small steps, is through you know establishing a prayer rule set to you by your spiritual father, through following the fasting ordinances of the church, by going to church, by participating in the liturgy, by participating in the sacraments as you were able, you know, things like that. And it's a very simple process, but it does take some time, and you have to be patient with yourself, and you cannot rely just upon yourself. You have to rely on your brothers and upon your spiritual father and upon the Holy Trinity itself. That's a great way to wrap things up. Thank you, Bryce. And that is our show for today. We want to thank you for joining us for this episode of Coming Out of Chaos. Please remember to check out our website at antiochianmen.org to learn more about our organization. We also have many videos available that can be found on that website as well as on our Amen YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We would also appreciate a positive review if the platform allows you to do so. Please share this podcast with your friends and help us to spread the word about it. If anyone would like to send us feedback, just send an email to amendomsi at gmail.com. That's A-M-E-N-D-O-M-S-E at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you if you have any questions or comments for us. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.